Hey, welcome to the next gathering of Microchurch Next. I'm Rob Wegner. This is my buddy, Brian Johnson. We both live in Kansas City, and we serve in the Kansas City Underground. We're a decentralized network of microchurches in our city, and we're working together to fill our city with the beauty, justice, and good news of Jesus. Uh, through Leadership Network, we're creating this table, this space every Tuesday for people who are pursuing simpler, hyper-local, deeply rooted, mission-centered expressions of the church, or what has become known as microchurch. For us, they're extended spiritual families uh, built around the person of Jesus. Uh, they're led by ordinary people uh, seeking to live in everyday gospel community. It's not about just having a meeting. Uh, it's about living on mission together in a network of relationships. And we're trying to create this space on Tuesdays where um, we can learn together and pay attention to what the spirit of God is doing in our country. Uh, this year's theme is the return of the microchurch, which is a little bit tongue in cheek um, because the microchurch is, we think, the oldest expression of the church. It's the most primal expression of the church. Uh, we see it so strongly embodied in, in the book of Acts and the epistles. We see it in the great moves of God in the history of the church and in so many of the church planning movements that are um, prevailing in the nations of the world today. Uh, but there is this reemergence here in the West. And uh, so we hope that you'll join us every Tuesday uh, for this fire so you can know you're not alone. Uh, you're not crazy. There is a real move of God in our midst in this hour. And uh, together we want to steward it. And so we're kicking off a new series today within that yearly theme. Um, and it's stories from the field, the emergence of movements of microchurches here in the West. And this is gonna be so fun because uh, there is this proliferation of movements of microchurches all over America right now and in Western Europe. And so we're gonna take some time to just hear the stories of different networks of microchurches um, from around the country every week. We'll be interviewing uh, leaders and teams from those networks and uh, Brian and I, as we were kicking this off, you know, we realized we we haven't actually had one of these sessions with just the two of us uh, <laughs> telling the story of the Kansas City Underground. Uh, so we're going to uh, have kind of a family moment today and share our story with you all. So, Brian, how you doing, man? You all I'm right? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I hope we don't get uh, weepy in here as we retell this story. But, dude, you know me. I'm kind of a crier. Yeah. Well. I'll fight you on that one. Um, you watched that movie, uh, Coda, on Apple TV. And Maddie, my oldest daughter, and I, we, we were like, yeah, I cried four times. <laughs> <laughs> we both cried at the exact same moments. We were like, such a good movie. All right, let's get back into this. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> so we're going to go We're gonna go over uh, four or five questions. Do you have a question? Oh, you're, oh, I got you. I'm locking in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So we're going to go over four or five questions as we retell our story. But we're also going to use these same questions as we interview these other networks that we'll be interviewing in the next several weeks. And so then we'll have some trick questions to punk them too. Well, I've, I've kind of set everybody up with, we're going to give you five questions, but we may not get to all five questions because we get distracted easily when you say things that are interesting and, and then we just chase those things. So yeah, this is these, these are the base level questions that we know we're going to try to hit. Like, how did we emerge as a network? What's the backstory, the origin story, um, where we are today, what it looks like on the ground. Uh, so the past, the present, how do we make disciples and equip people within this framework that we're exploring what are repeated principles or patterns that we've seen emerge over the last few years? And some of these networks are 10, 15, 20 years old, really. Like they were sort of hidden and unknown. Uh, so like their stories of repeated principles, just seeing what the overlap is with what we're currently exploring within a three-year sort of history. What are the difficult moments we had? So we're not going to just tell you all the good things, but like what's bad? Why is what's been hard over the last three or four years and then where are we headed? So that's the future oriented um, 
part of the conversation. I know when we kick this off or this idea, should we interview people? What kind of questions should we ask? Our story uh, really kind of centered into, I think the, the label that we put on this is how can the predominant model or the, the model of the church, the form of the church that we've known really birth a new wineskin? And that's what we would say. It's like, this is a new wineskin that we're beginning to live into and experiment with and, and practice with. So let's go back to the origin story. Um, we both landed in Kansas City uh, I don't know, six or seven years ago. You were here a year before me. And so why don't you take us back to like pre the underground officially launched. We're both working for a mega church here in Kansas City. Um, and on all the way back to that place where it's like, when we tell our story, we say it's like officially three years old, but there's really like the seven to eight year backstory that sort of set it up. And it's really beyond that. If you wanted to go back into the things that we were exploring 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Um, and I always say this when I'm sharing our story, like I'm sharing this from my perspective. Um, but there were these, uh, like what seven couples that were um, not all of us were in the same context. So you and I were at Westside family church, but some of these other kind of anchor people that were in essence, founders of the Kansas city underground, uh, they were in other contexts. So I, I just want to be mindful of that to say um, it's a little piece of the story. It's one piece of the story, you know, uh, but I, I would say something that, does seem to be a common theme for us is all all those founding couples have had uh, experience in large churches um a really high percentage of them were even on staff in large churches um and um so all god moving in and through uh sort of the what you could call the attractional form of church uh church being rebooted around the idea of being a church for the unchurched being externally focused uh all the catchphrases of the church growth movement, uh, like being culturally relevant. Um, and get, all of us got involved in that because of uh, like a missional impulse in our heart. Um, most of us had grown up in kind of sleepy insular churches um, that weren't really on mission in terms of like making new disciples and, and um, connecting with people that were really far from God. And uh, so, um, I think all of us also got to a point where, um, like I, I was in a large church in Indiana and it, it just started, uh, it was, it felt like a miracle in the corn in a cornfield. Like I, I remember the first year we baptized more than a hundred people in one year. And I was like, I've never been in a church like this because in it, because it wasn't just kids that grew up in the church. It's all these like you know, teenagers and 20 somethings and 30 and 40. I remember even old people getting baptized, meeting Jesus. It's like, this is amazing. And they're all inviting their network of relationships, work, which weren't church people. It was like the first church I've been in that was truly evangelistic. And it was like ama amazing. But I think all of us, although we'd had that experience, we also reached a point where we began to see sort of the dark side of that particular way of being the church too. Um, so with that as sort of a backdrop, all of us had become sort of mad scientists um, within large churches trying to say like, okay, there seems to be the dark side of this. It, it, it does feel like we're creating some kind of consumeristic culture. It, it seems like we're creating this codependent relationship where people aren't really disciple makers. They're more like they attend and they invite and other people come. And then there's this sort of dependency on the church to have programs or groups, but these programs and groups don't really seem to be empowering people to be fully on mission and we'd all been exposed to the church um, outside the Western world, like disciple making movements and church planning movements, which are these people movements where ordinary people are, are making disciples in a multi-generational way. There's these simple forms of church that ordinary people are leading there, uh, lowers the bar on what it takes to do church. It's raising the bar on disciple making. So those are common themes, I think. And so for you and I, our particular lens was that um, we both landed at Westside Family Church, um, which is this amazing influential church in Kansas City. It's been really catalytic in terms of bringing the big C church together at a lot of different levels, like caring for orphans and foster care, like church planting in the city. Um, 
and a lot of other really beautiful things. And uh, we got this special uh, kind of freedom yeah. where we had both had, had been running experiments in our, our context, you down south and me up north. <laughs> and we started to see micro churches emerge as kind of skunk works in the large churches that we were leading. And we got this crazy opportunity. Westside was crazy enough to go, yeah, you guys can come and you'll have some other responsibilities, but a big part of your job description, we want you to just train ordinary people to be what we would call missionaries and to see these micro churches emerge, which is amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I do think that one of the most hopeful things for the church in the West in terms of the future is um, existing churches creating space uh, for skunk works. And what we mean by skunk works is like freeing up time, energy, money, resources, staff people to build something new alongside the old. Um, mm -hmm. That's a different wineskin. And it takes a secure uh, church and a church leadership team to allow that to happen. Yeah. Uh, so with that context, I'm going to hand it back to you. So what did that, what was going on at Westside? Yeah, I was going to say that you, you, you framed up one piece, which is like, there's a group of people who have had an experience that we're trying to pioneer new things. You have like kind of a high bent on, I want to go try something new. So we both had, I, I would say, looking back, we both had micro churches in our previous context, but didn't have the language necessarily. It was like, well, there's these people we're discipling and we share these meals together and we're prayer walking here and looking for persons of peace and doing these unique missional works in the city. And there's these little families that are emerging and we're thinking about multiplication in smaller ways across the city but just didn't know what to call it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, this is called, exciting. We called it like a Granger, like we were talking about essential churches. Yeah. Then it's kind of a punch in the face to the old model. Cause it's like, <laughs> oh, what, we're not essential. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we got with simple church. Now there's simple churches, but then it's like, well, there's this guy Rainer who wrote this book on simple church is actually not about small yeah, simple yeah. expressions of church. It's about streamlining the organized church, you know? So yeah, totally using yeah. phrases that probably weren't that helpful. So we got that, we have that one lens that's like you have what we call affectionately the crazies. You get out there a little further and you're just trying stuff. The other thing that was key in our story, and I'd say it's probably true across the board for other networks that have emerged, is like there is this rich disciple making culture at the base. Um, this fertile soil of people that are within that context, whatever the context may be, that are thinking like, how do we make disciples that can make disciples that can make disciples? Uh, just listening to some of these other uh, friends that we'll interview and knowing a little bit of the backstory, like that's that's at the heart of it. And at Westside, there was um, a friend of ours, Brian Phipps, who had been actively thinking like, all right, how do I take these followers of Jesus that are already present in this context, and how do I help them experience this fully alive life in Jesus? Uh, understanding that they need to grow in character and grow in their calling. And, and he was seeing like this multiplication of leaders out to the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation. And when we stepped in, it was like, man, I don't think I'd ever been in an environment where you could just clearly map out the numbers of people that were leading other people to understand their character and their calling. Mm -hmm. And we were able to invite leaders from this huge body of, you know, people that knew how to lead others to understand their character and their calling and then lead others to do that and say, hey, we want to train you on how to incarnate, how, how to take your life and move out of these four walls and do it where you live, work, learn, and play. Yeah. How do you begin to look like Jesus in those spaces and invite people? Because we were like, clearly we're in this space and this time of uh, people aren't coming to the four walls, right? They're not coming to a building. Like we, one of our, one of those founding members of the underground uh, her story is a neighbor, you know, she's been inviting her to Easter and Christmas <laughs> for like 10 years. <laughs> and finally, her neighbor says, I love you. Thank you for inviting me. We're never coming. Right. This is like, that's a moment in the, in the sand where it's like, so what am I going to do? Do I care about this person enough to go to them with the gospel or am I just going to keep inviting anyway to say, come this way with me? Yeah. And so we began to just take these leaders who understood disciple making and multiplication, and we gave them these simple tools of 
what we call the bless rhythm. So we got to interview John Ferguson just recently about that. The simple incarnational rhythms is what we call them. How do you begin in prayer for a network of relationships or a neighborhood? How do you begin to listen to the stories of that people in that place, throw parties, really create this kind of like rhythm of just being together, sharing meals, serving them tangibly, making the kingdom present, and then sharing how Jesus has changed you and the gospel changes everything. And consistently, like through this process of training these leaders, I think it was probably maybe a year or two, we had trained about 100, 150 people. And we're consistently hearing these stories of uh, my coworkers, my neighbors, these people in my life, they're taking spiritual steps towards Jesus, but they still don't want to come to the weekend. What do we do? And that's where we created another training environment where we began to train people on how do you create the everyday rhythms of an extended spiritual family in your network. So I'm going to kick it back to you to talk about that piece. Yeah. And we, uh, everybody who, you know, ended up being what you could call founder in the underground, those, those couples, they all had a very similar story of um, at some point re reaching a tension point where it's like, um, I have to be willing to launch out from what I've known. Um, and I remember this was a moment that happened to me before I moved to Kansas City, you know, when I was in Granger, where I realized um, I was over local mission and global mission, and we were experiencing amazing moves of the spirit, both in an inner city neighborhood and then in southern India. Um, and then I'm teaching a lot on the weekends there. Um, and the church had grown to be a very, very large church. But I realized I'd let that pull me out of my context in my neighborhood. Hmm. And, and I was almost like in my mind, giving myself credit as a disciple maker, because I'm leading these amazing local and global mission initiatives, you know, and, and suddenly I just, uh, I could see it. Like I'm, I'm skipping my own Jerusalem to go to Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, and stand at the end of my driveway, looking it was like a Saturday. So a lot of neighbors were out and I'm like, I don't even know these people's names, two houses down. Yeah. And I just knew it. it's like, if Jesus lived in my neighborhood, it wouldn't be like this, mm -mm. you know, and everybody who's in the Kansas city underground, we let it really uh, intense levels in the predominant model, you know, of church and reach this point of conflict where it's like, Oh man, there's something off here. Like I've, um, and you know, just going forward in repentance um, of saying, Jesus, um, I want to be where you are. I want to, I want to um, join you in what you're doing in my context, my neighborhood. And um, so you and I had this really um, with our wives had an amazing opportunity to move to Kansas city to bring that past experience, you know, and I just want to share for us while we're discipling others in this, we're also managing the tension of like, Hey, the first 18 months of my neighborhood, I'm living the blessed rhythms. I haven't had any spiritual conversations with anyone, <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm very apostolic. I'm like, this should be going faster. What is wrong? Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, turning it into something about my ego and identity rather than uh, simple obedience and trust in Jesus. And, um, and then we saw, you know, in our neighborhood, a spiritual breakthrough with one of our neighbors who met Jesus in such a powerful way. And she shared her story with another neighbor who then he met Jesus in such a powerful way and it started this chain reaction. And we began to experience more and more deeply our primary church being in our neighborhoods, you know. Um, and it's almost like, uh, I mean, this is no offense to anyone. It was almost like being like I work at a church and that's my job. But I'm also just an ordinary person on mission in my context, you know, and um, and that began to uh, multiply. So then it's like, wow, we're starting to have this network of micro churches and they're being led by ordinary people. And uh, it was this beautiful uh, kind of slow burn over uh, five, six years. And we kept reproducing these like cohorts. And uh, I remember at one point on our second cohort of the microchurch, what was called the microchurch learning community, um, which was this 12 month journey. So people would get trained in the bless rhythms and this thing we called missionaries made and in gospel fluency, like how to speak the gospel to themselves and to 
others as a normal language, not as like some weird Amway presentation. Um, and then they started seeing these communities emerge. So like you say, we created the microchurch learning community. And I remember we were going through the second cycle and out of that batch, um, we saw like, like a, what we considered sort of like a 30% success rate. And like out of, you know, the, the folks that are in it, we had th these many microchurches emerge and that was only 30%. And we, I was debriefing with Ralph Moore because I had this incredible opportunity to hang with him. And I was telling him how sad I was about how only 30% of those that had been through it had seen a microchurch emerge and and he was and he he said hey rob how many churches are in the hope chapel network and i was like i actually was hurt i was like man that's what in my, in my head i'm like that's just cocky like what the heck <laughs> i was like 2300 thanks yeah. ralph <laughs> and he was like guess what our success rate was i was like i don't know he's like 30 percent yeah 30 percent of the people we trained ended up leading what you could call a micro church or mm -hmm. so he's like just keep going <laughs> yeah yeah and that's what we did we just realized we reached a point i'm gonna move us a little bit further because we got some questions coming in i want to get to as well yeah, it's let's like do it, man. we had you know about five or six micro churches and we realized like i think that we need clarity on um you know what is the what's the strategy going forward how do people begin to understand their identity in this? Uh, and we put together this, I don't know, man, it was like a 37 page sort of proposal that was like, what would it look like to have uh, an equipping hub that began to equip ordinary missional leaders to see new micro churches emerge all over the city. And we presented it to uh, the elders and, you know, just, we spent, weeks on this thing right it's like this is this is what we think may happen if we just really lean into this um and just out of that presentation came this you know this blessing to absolutely like let's let's bless this new experiment in kansas city called the kansas city underground and there's this I'm, i feel like we're skipping over some mountain peaks here but it was this catalytic moment for us of like, it's go time. It's time to create this new little organization that is just going to be this little seed in the city that is going to dream about what would it look like for every man, woman, boy, and girl to have repeated opportunities to see, hear, experience, and respond to the gospel. And how can we scale this thing across the city to see the beauty, the justice, the good news of Jesus? And so we went through a process of inviting people to come with us. Um, and I, I think like we always say five or six micro churches had emerged at that point. Uh, three of those little extended spiritual families said, we're in, we're going to go with you. Two or three were like, we're good at Westside. <laughs> um, and then we had uh, these 72 missionary commitments and uh, we launched officially as the underground in Kansas City in 2019. Have, let me share this one short story. Yeah. So we did. Uh, Westside was really supportive. We said, hey, listen, there's people we've discipled and uh, they're going to want to come with us. And there was some, some trepidation. There were some of the elders who were like, whoa, whoa, what is going on? What are you guys going to do? How's this going to go? Because I think there was some sense like we were just going to go plant a church. Right. You know, and even though we kept saying, no, we're not going to go plant a church, pretty much all people have seen is this kind of launch large or you take hundreds of people and you start a weekend service and children's ministry and all that stuff. And we kept going, that's really not what we're going to do. We're starting a mission agency. That's the way we started describing it. It's a mission agency for gospel saturation in Kansas City. Like we want a missionary in every street. We want to see a micro church in every network of relationships. Um, and we had this first information meeting. And, uh, and I taught a lot on the weekends at Westside. Brian was one of the primary worship leaders. So this first meeting, there was hundreds of people. And they were sure we we're going to go plant a cooler, <laughs> sexier, more awesome church. <laughs> and, we, and we started like, no, this is, we're going to start a mission agency. And we're going to train you. Like, you'll be a disciple maker. You'll be a missionary. You're going to be leading. And you can watch in real time as people started like getting more and more uncomfortable and looking at their watches, like, how do I get out of this room? I just wanted to go hear you preach more. <laughs> Not happening. 
Yeah. And there was, a, there was a couple of the elders who were in the back of the room and they came up after their meeting. They're like, you know, you kept your word. Yeah, you did. You scared almost everyone away. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. But I love to tell people that story because I think uh, I want to be really clear. You know, we, we never wanted to plant microchurches or right. plant a church. It's like, no, we wanted to plant ordinary people deeply in relational networks as missionary disciple makers, help them learn how to plant the gospel, make new disciples and have micro churches emerge, you know? And mm. so with those 72 missionaries, we did all these house meetings and information meeting. Like one of the key things that I love to share about our story was we, even then there were still some of those 72 people that I think still thought eventually we're just going to do a normal church plant. So, yeah. and and we, one of the things we did that was sort of, I think, a line in the sand is we didn't organize people into microchurches. Right. Like we said, we're going to have an equipping gathering and we're going to have coaching and we're going to stay with you. Um, but you're, you've been sent, you know? And so, because if you start organizing people into microchurches, it's probably just going to fall back to small groups, like what people have known, you know? Yeah. And that was one of the things that we were led by Jesus to do that I'm really grateful you know, yeah. and I, I'd like to highlight that part of the story because if you're starting new, um, I think that's an important thing to latch on to. Yeah. Well, I think we've hit where we were and I know we're skipping over a bunch of stuff, but I'm going to go to where we are today. Yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the screen to show you uh, our four organizing identities. Ho hopefully this works because we were like, this through is gonna get to David, your question, who I know is watching. Yep. Uh, he, he was asking about, uh, how do you organize? What's the leadership structure? Right. Is there a corporate worship? Great questions. Yeah, I think we're going to get to several of these questions by throwing this image up and kind of walking through this. So I think I don't remember at what point we were, but language started to shift and we were realizing like, OK, uh, we need some clarity around the definitions for who we are. Uh, and within every um every organization, right? There's organizing identities. Did that work, man? I hope that worked. I hope you can see all four. Did it show up yeah. on your screen? Cool. Yeah, we got it. And so we just really felt like, man, we've got to embrace disciple making movements. Uh, we, we've, we've got to look at what our sisters and brothers in the global South are teaching us about multiplication and how they're thinking about the church. And we realized, man, the form of the church, like we're focusing on micro church, that's important, but how do we get there? How do we help people arrive at that place? And so we came up with these four organizing identities uh, that we put some definitions to it that begin to help us understand, okay, this is, this is how we're thinking about mobilizing everyday people within their spaces. So the first organizing identity is a missionary. So our definition for a missionary is an ordinary person who plants themselves within an unreached pocket of people. They plant the gospel in order to make new disciples. Like we wanted disciple making to be really just baked into who we are. So ordinary people, everybody raises their hand here because we're all ordinary. Even the people that think they're special are ordinary. <laughs> ordinary people that plant themselves within unreached pockets of people. They plant the gospel in order to make new disciples. So that's our definition of a missionary. So we look at everybody that's connected to the, the Kansas City underground that says, I'm, I'm committed to gospel saturation in the city. That, that's the, the identity that they own first and foremost. I'm a missionary disciple maker. Those words we use kind of interchangeably. When they plant themselves, when they plant the gospel, as they make new disciples, what emerges is the microchurch. Why don't you take that one? Yeah, so uh, we don't use the language of planting micro churches and the reason we don't is i think that language um, has some baggage with it so when people hear the word church planting it comes with uh, a long history of what has been done as church planting in the western world um, the primary model has probably been uh, at least for the last 20 years the big emphasis is, had been on what's called launch large so it's like i got i want to try to build a core group um, so that when we launch the first service, there's 200 people um, with a certain level of like high quality worship and children's ministry. Uh, the goal was for that to be sustainable, you know, uh, financially day one. So when people hear church planting, the 
what goes unsaid a lot of times is, well, that it's about starting worship services. It's about starting new meetings, you know, and I'm for all of that, but um, that wasn't our motivation. That's not our end game. Um, do micro churches have meetings? Yes. And we can even talk about what they do in those meetings. Um, but fundamentally, it's a new extended spiritual family that orbits around the person of Jesus, who's worthy of um, all of our allegiance, all of our attention, all of our affection, who's already at work in the context that we're in, drawing people to himself. And, and discipleship is joining Jesus in that. And, and when this new extended spiritual family emerges, um, the people that were making disciples, um, they've become spiritual parents. Mm. And, and now they have a family that they're um, caring for and leading and helping them develop. And, and uh, it's, it's uh, like an elder, you know, where you're, you're, you have a family tree and you want just like any family for it to continue on with children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And there's three um, dimensions of our life together to help us um, make this group, the church. So of course it's the Lordship of Jesus, which is about moving from unbelief to belief in Jesus in every area of life, um, letting the gospel set our understanding of who God is, who we are, uh, why we're here. And, um, and those three dimensions are worship, community, and mission. Mm. So worship again is Romans 12, um, where I, all of my life coming under the influence of, of um, Jesus' leadership. It's also community. So community means we're going to live out the one another's in a daily way. Um, we're going to bear each other's burdens. We're going to pray for each other, care for each other, love one another, all the above. And then mission, which is to make new disciples and to make the kingdom of God tangible on earth. Thy kingdom come, they will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And our micro churches have rhythms of worship, community, and mission. And just real briefly, someone's asking, hey, what do we do when a micro church gathers? Uh, what does it look like to be in a micro church? Well, we typically tell people to really answer that question, you have to come live with us for a couple of weeks. Yeah, because like with any family, there's certain organized parts of it. Like if you have a healthy family, you're gonna be like, hey, we're gonna eat dinner together at the table so many nights a week. And then we take the Sabbath together and have fun together. And then we, you know, and we, we have these organized points that keep you connected. But most of life is the organic stuff that happens between the organized points. And it's the same way in a microchurch family. So yeah. you set up organized rhythms around worship, community, and mission. Um, and then there's all the organic touches of the in-between you know? Mm -hmm. And so when people ask, like, what does a microchurch do? A lot of times what they want to know is like, well, what do you do in your meetings? <laughs> so it depends on if it's an up, in, or out. So if it's an out, it's probably going to look like some kind of serve or like serving in our context. So for us, like in a neighborhood, that might be something as simple as a work project in somebody's um, yard that we're all going to jump in together because she's a widow and she needs help. And we're going to make sure that she gets that job done. You know, it's spring cleaning time or it's a, a meal train like Lori had surgery and we're going to set up meals and carry those over to her and let her know we love her and care for her. Or it might be a party uh, where it's like this socially inclusive space where anybody in our context can be invited. If it's an up, we're going to gather typically around a meal. We're going to gather around the scriptures and there's a time to uh, look back and say, uh, what are we thankful for from this last week? What's been challenging? Uh, we report in on uh, what you could call obedience. Like we write these I will statements. Like what is the spirit of God leading us to do in response to his word and his leadership? So we could report in, how's it going with your I will statements? And then we, we look into God's word um, and we study God's word together. It's a, most of the micro churches, it's a discovery based approach. So instead of there being um, a teacher that we all listen to, we're going to go directly to the scriptures and to discover together through wonderful open-ended questions like, what does this passage tell us about who God is, his nature, and his ways? What does this tell us about people in general? What is this saying to me? What is the spirit of God highlighting for me? And then what will I do about it? You know, And then we look forward. It's like, okay, here's my I will statement. And then who else could I share this with this week? It's a very simple way yeah. of gathering yeah you know and then um most of the micro church uh existence is in kind of the blood sweat and tears of everyday life 
and mm -hmm. join his disciples in those spaces. So you have the missionaries, the microchurches. When microchurches begin to add or multiply, either in a hyper local place or in an affinity group, uh, we have what we call a collective. So I, I'll hand it back to you, Brad. Yeah, simply collectives are networks of microchurches. So if it's a network of microchurches of guys that have been uh, affected by incarceration or addiction, so Share the Hope is one of these collectives. It's eight of these microchurches that have emerged out of that story. They don't share a geographical location. They're, they're guys and their families from sort of all parts of Kansas City, but they share a similar story. And they've multiplied within uh, the jail context in Kansas City. Or it might be geographical. So four or five um, kind of neighborhood-based microchurches that are within you know, uh, maybe a half mile of each other, something like that. So we network them together and they have shared resources. They have, uh, so they can do more together. Like uh, our, our micro churches in our context uh, adopted a school at Christmas time and just basically owned, uh, went from one grade last year to like the whole school this year. <laughs> like, how can we begin to just bless some of the students that don't have the same uh, privileges, same access? Uh, so we've shared resources. We have shared mission. We want to see disciple making multiply either within this network of relationships or within this geographical area. Uh, shared governing elders. So uh, elders from within those micro churches that are trained at a, at a higher level, a deeper level about what is it, how are we going to um, pray for this group of micro churches? How are we going to fast for God to move within these families? How are we going to help deal with conflicts that may arise within this? Uh, so shared resources, shared mission, shared uh, governing elders, and potentially even shared gathering. So one of our collectives is already beginning to explore what a shared gatherings of multiple micro churches look like. And that'll be something that continues to emerge. Uh, so these three identities are within what we call our decentralized network of missionaries and micro churches. And we'll show you the bigger image in a minute that kind of explains how it all works. And so the final uh, organizing identity would be a hub. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll up while you explain this one, Rob. Yeah. So a hub isn't so much about a place or a building or a space. It's about an apostolic equipping team. So if you think of Paul, he's renting the hall in Ephesus, and there's a gang of eight who are all kind of crazy apostolic leaders, and they're joining Paul in Ephesus, traveling with him, and it basically becomes a training center. And then um, there's a wonderful book. It's called The Untold Story of the New Testament by Frank Viola where he unpacks chronologically how the church multiplied and expanded. And one of the things that's easy to miss is actually out of that equipping hub in Ephesus is this whole, it's like a chain reaction of microchurches all through that trade corridor, uh, many of which get named in the book of Revelation. Um, so it's this apostolic equipping team that's supporting the disciple makers, the microchurches, the networks that are emerging to keep advancing the gospel and to basically accomplish Ephesians 4, which is to equip the saints for the works of service. And we do that with five voices, the apostolic voice, the prophetic voice, the evangelistic voice, the teaching voice, and also the shepherding voice. And so a hub team has those five voices. They're intentionally equipping the missionaries and the microchurches and the elders that are in the decentralized network. And I wanted to just say as a note, you know, we started with one hub in Shawnee, Kansas, and uh, we've seen that multiply to seven different hub teams around the city, supporting multiple collectives and microchurches and missionaries all over the city. And what's been cool is we started really as a kind of like a neighborhood movement in one suburb. And now, if you look at the collective leadership of the Kansas City Underground, all those hub teams, uh, we have ethnic diversity, we have socioeconomic diversity, it's male and female. It looks like our city now. Um, mm -hmm. And that's been one of the things that we want to give God the most glory for um, has been that kind of apostolic spread. And in early in our story, uh, this is really important, I think, in the first, we're only three years old, so we're still very early in our story, but very, 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 very early in our story. 
Um, and this is, I think, important for the hub conversation. Um, it says in Ephesians 2.20 that the apostles and the prophets are the foundation. And we saw this really great gift of God where the, that original group um, of kind of founding couples, if you cut them all, they bled the apostolic. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of that gang, again, had been on staff in large churches, uh, really passionate about church planning, global mission. Uh, we'd all been exposed to this other kind of movemental form of the church that ruined us. Um, and uh, returning to our story, you know, back in the predominant model church, um, we were just so hungry. We see these disciple making movements in other places. It's kind of God like, why, why not here? Why not us? So mm -hmm. that particular gang, long stories of deep personal repentance, like for us as apostles, like, hey, we have to return to extraordinary prayer and fasting rather than our obsession with action and plans and strategies. Deep commitments personally to be disciple makers, to live deep in a particular context among an unreached pocket of people. And this radical commitment to a simpler form of church is the primary expression and the multiplication of all that. Um, and what was interesting, though, is very early on in our story, there was this other gang that God brought in and, and if you cut them, they would bleed the prophetic. Mm -hmm. So they're about hearing and seeing, questioning, critiquing, um, like forth telling with a timely word from the spirit. Um, and they'd been a part of um, the deep prophetic and prayer movement here in Kansas City that includes things like the International House of Prayer. Um, and they were very radical about like abiding, extended times of prayer, the heavenly throne room, dreams, visions, signs, wonders. And this, if the apostolic crew had to repent of self-sufficiency, addiction to activity, always running, leaving people behind, not valuing the other four voices, this prophetic crew would tell you that they realized they needed to repent of like emotional and relational immaturity, being cloistered away in their prayer closets, being super captivated with dreams and visions rather than gospel saturation in the city. They weren't maybe valuing all the other voices. And there's been this kind of slow burn of those two gangs sort of merging, colliding. Um, the apostolic crew saying, hey, uh, we're gonna go slow. Slow is gonna be the new fast. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna grow in extraordinary prayer and fasting. And even in our equipping, because one of the things that a hub offers is an equipping gathering. Um, I mean, we pretty much just said from the very beginning, like for months and months and months and months, we're just going to learn how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. We're going to learn how to pray. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to learn how to fast. Uh, we're going to figure out that uh, repentance is our only way forward, not wonderful strategy, great plans, <laughs> awesome, you know, <laughs> execution. Um, and that's something I'm really grateful for, like that, that we said, I think, by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, um, this partnership between the apostolic and prophetic is kind of a, a phalanx, a tip of the spear. Yeah, yeah. Well, one last thing just on this piece of hubs is remembering that the hub for us is not a directive over the decentralized network. We don't tell missionaries and micro churches and collectives what to do. This is really a service platform. Uh, these teams exist now for the sake of helping fuel and equip these missionary leaders out here that are saying, I, I think Jesus is calling me to make disciples among X, or I believe he's calling me to do, you know, to bring beauty in this way to our city and like personal calling and discoveries there to help you understand that startup coaching is there to help you get going in it. Um, and it, again, it's really about coming alongside of not about dictating to, if anything, it's uh, underneath fueling and, and pushing forward. And uh, just with the last little bit that we've got here, I wanted to pull up one more image of the missionary pathway, because uh, one of the questions is did most micro churches start with only two or three people and then grow? And, you know, we interviewed Isla Tassi uh, a few, uh, maybe a month ago. You know, if you we not listen to that one, yeah. go back, do yourself a favor. For sure. Go find it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to hit this at a really high level really fast so we can maybe get a little more of those questions. But 
to answer our question is what are the repeated principles that you've seen emerge is most of our micro churches emerged because some of the or not not some of what happened was the repeated pattern was individual followers of jesus owning their identity as a disciple maker and saying i know it's my neighborhood or i know it's this network of relationships and i'm just going to begin to pray extraordinarily for them mm-hmm. i'm going to pray jesus where are you at work jesus how can i join you in this And then they began to live as a missionary again, using those blush rhythms or some other way to incarnate the gospel, to move deeply into the quote unquote, the neighborhood. So if it's guys that are coming out of incarceration, it's like missionary leaders were saying, I'm going to show up at the jail and just sit and have conversations with people. I'm going to just be present or we're going to exist in the transitional housing uh, with these guys that are moving in that way. So living as a missionary and then hearing the voice of the spirit and knowing this is a moment to plant the gospel. It's a moment to invite this other person to discover Jesus and follow him in obedience. And of the, I think, 54 micro churches that we've seen emerge in the last uh, three years, we'd say about 95% emerged because an individual, well, not individuals, we say nobody's sin alone. So at least in pairs, uh, people are determining what is my missional context to whom have I been sent? How can I make the kingdom tangible among them and then invite them to discover Jesus? And then these families emerge out of that. These new micro churches emerge out of that context. Uh, so I would say that is like the the primary repeating pattern that we're trying to pay attention to and say our role in disciple making as the underground, as an organizational side, the hub side is to think through how can we effectively equip new disciple makers for new context to invite them into those spaces to explore what Jesus is doing and join him in those places. Amen. And I, I want to just riff off of that. Um, this is William's question. Uh, he says, what does it look like to support new missionaries as they begin to serve in their area without burning out? Great question. So one of the things that um, is helpful to understand is as people are on the missionary pathway, first of all, having the missionary pathway is another thing that allows for a sense of appropriate spirit-led pacing. hmm instead of like heavy apostolic expectation to pr- produce a lot of fruit in a certain time set. So what I mean by that is we tell people like every context, it's a different time frame. It's the same five phases. Um, and you need to have a sense of where you're at. So you know what tools to use, you know where you're at in terms of cooperating with the Lord in this part of the harvest. So just having these five phases in front of people helps avoid burnout because they have a sense of, oh, this is a journey. And I have to follow the leadership, the spirit in my context. The other thing, William, is we have these different um, equipping teams. Uh, So for example, we have what's called the personal calling and discovery team. So we're any missional leader, anyone who becomes a missionary in the underground, we offer to them, hey, we'd, we'd love to help you with a process of calling discovery to get clarity on your gifts, your passion, your story, to whom you're sent. Another big piece of that is team formation. Mm -hmm. So here's who else you're going to need on your team, because that's a big part of burnout, is not having a team that's built around the five voices, for example, or or complementing gifts. Um, uh, Another piece of personal discovery is uh, soul care and spiritual formation. So we put together personalized spiritual formation plan for anyone who goes through that personal discovery process. And then they're offered like a, um, a spiritual director type relationship with someone from that team who's willing to meet with them periodically in terms of kind of the care for their own soul. Um, then we have startup coaching, you know, so we take people through a seven week uh, overview of the missionary pathway and some of the essential tools. Then there's ongoing coaching. This is another thing that helps people avoid burnout. So every missional leader, every micro church in the Kansas City Underground is in a coaching circle. And having a coaching circle, it, it becomes another community of support where your peers are, are praying for you, supporting you, because that coaching circle stays the same. So you actually have this 
community of support. Um, and then we offer, uh, we have financial services. So a significant part of our budget is grants to accelerate mission that missionaries and micro churches can apply for. Uh, and then we have a weekly equipping gathering. And now we actually have multiple equipping gatherings happening around the city where any micro church leader, any missional leader can come into an equipping gathering where they're going to be supported, equipped, trained, coached. These are the kind of things that help us avoid burnout. The other big thing is we've really tried to create a culture of extraordinary prayer and fasting. Mm -hmm. so we have corporate rhythms of prayer and fasting that I think change the culture um, of the entire network where this is about abiding. This is about working from a place of rest. Like prayer is the work. Abiding is the source. Uh, it's not my human strategy or my human striving that's going to yield permanent and lasting fruit. So those are just some of the things right off the top, William. I hope that that helps, you know. And Justin, you had asked, I think, uh, or Luke rather, you know, what about the traditional Western model of church? Yeah. Uh, do we throw the baby out with the bathwater? Brian, why don't you talk a little bit about how we're relating to, I'm actually at a large church here in Kansas City. I've been training the staff in the missionary pathway. So why don't you unpack like the way we're relating to kind of predominant model churches in our city? Yeah, we have this terrible, terrible joke that you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's a waste of water and it's just unkind to the baby. <laughs> so <laughs> don't do that. Um, we have this missionary pathway huddle. Uh, it's a seven week training around the rhythms of disciple making in its most basic form and joining Jesus in the context to which he's called you. And so we have some partner churches here in the city that we're friends with the staff teams and just began to tell our story, pray for them, talk about what does unity look like. And the invitation was there of, will you start with our staff, train our staff through the missionary pathway? And two specific ones, apart from the one that Rob is uh, presently physically at, are now in their second, third, fourth generation of training people through this missionary pathway. And they're dreaming about how do we see microchurches emerge in our context that would relate to us as their hub team? And so they may have more identity with that weekend expression of the church still, uh, but it's like if if the Kansas City underground is out here on microchurches are autonomous, it's this decentralized network with governing elders. And then over here at this end of the continuum is uh, no to microchurches. <laughs> this we're just in the predominant model. They're exploring what does this the ecosystem of all of that look like in the middle? How can we still take advantage of this weekend gathering that we're great at? that people are going to encounter Jesus in this environment, that um, we have great programs offered to families and kids and men, women, but how do we also begin to train people as disciple makers within their context? And the leaders may re relate very strategically to that weekend, but maybe the people that are in that extended spiritual family don't have the same connection. So there's a, this, this is long continuum. Like we always like to say our story and, and the way that we've explained microchurches and the equipping that we do is, is just one way to talk about it. It's just one expression. And what we hope is that in thinking of that continuum and the full ecosystem of all the forms of churches, and Jesus is way more creative than we are. Uh, and, you know, it's like take advantage of everything. If you have a weekend expression, the traditional Western church model, and there are already people that are showing up to encounter Jesus. How can you uh, utilize that space to train everyday disciple makers? How do you use those environments that already exist to equip people in those spaces? Um, trying to hit another question or two here, uh, going all the way back up to uh, David, what does corporate worship look like? What's the spiritual leadership structure? I think we talked a little bit about the leadership structure. Um, I'll just quickly say we, we do gather once a month to with the whole network invited in just to pray together, sing together. We don't do equipping in those spaces because we're really just wanting the spirit of God to come in uh, and do the equipping for us in our own souls, just listening for his voice and asking where he might be leading us specifically next uh, in the city. 
um, Luke, William, Justin, David, thank you for pitching questions to us. We only have about five minutes left. So I wanted to throw this to Rob. If you could summarize where we're headed in like two to minutes. I was about to say two to three, but I'm going to give you two. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep it quick. Yeah, I think we have a sense um, that we're going from phase one to phase two. Um, there's been this new uh, subdivision that's been being constructed uh, behind our neighborhood. And it used to be this big open uh, acreage. We, we called it Rainbow County Park. Like we used to walk back there and there was lakes and deer and <laughs> beaver. And now they, they've cleared it all out, which was heart aching. It broke our hearts, but they put in a new kind of bypass and they're building these new neighborhoods. And it's been interesting. It's been like a prophetic symbol for the underground. Mm. So they built phase one. And at the end of phase one, I counted up the houses in phase one in this neighborhood. And it, it actually almost exactly equaled the number of micro churches that had emerged at that time. And then they opened up phase two recently. And that's where we feel like we're standing. Like there, there's been this like multiplication of hub teams around the city, um, the geographic spread um, and uh, of the micro churches has, has increased significantly. And we're having to figure out um, more and more what it means to be like a family of families mm. and a team of teams. And how do we relate um, across this decentralized network where we're um, making sure that like the, the power and the authority and uh, the mutual submission um, is spreading through the entire network. So phase one to phase two, uh, we went from like one hub with three micro churches to multiple hubs and an increase in micro churches and missionaries. And another big part of phase two is us integrating more and more with, um, you know, a, an equipping role in the city. Um, that's kind of like big C church. Uh, so we're connecting and building kind of strategic alliances with local churches and organizations around gospel saturation, where we're standing together as equals on mission um so it's exciting so that's that's my best shot in two minutes yeah so good well i just want to wrap up by saying again to those of you that were posing questions and engaging with us today love that uh hope that you'll continue to come back join us on these tuesdays where we're gathering for this and uh, keep asking those questions learn from these other leaders this is what we'll be doing for the next several weeks again it's just interviewing other Microchurch networks, uh, specifically in the West, again, just curious, how did you emerge? What are the stories behind what you're doing? What are the repeating principles that you're seeing? How can we learn from each other? We want it to be a conversation that inspires missional imagination and helps us all to think more creatively. Uh, we won't be back next week. Uh, so next week, we won't have a live stream of this show. But we will be streaming the, the Nashville regional event for Exponential. So if you're near Nashville, you should go to Exponential's website, grab a ticket, jump in, experience some of that live conversation. Uh, so we'll be back in two weeks with Adonacio Segovia. He will be sharing the story of the Soma family of churches, how they emerged, all of the things that we got into today, but just from their perspective. So Again, uh, so thankful that you're a part of today. Uh, you can check more of our story at caseyunderground.org. Um, Rob, anything else to add on that? No, I just... Uh, oh, you know what? I will, I will push your book real quick. So Starfish in the Spirit, if you haven't read that book, tells a little bit of the story of the underground as well. So it's a okay. fantastic read. Thanks, bro. Yeah, I'm just, I'm very excited about this series. I'm excited about... Um, we've started to get some of the data and the analytics and it seems like there's a little community of us that are coming together on Tuesdays. And we just want to bless you in the name of Jesus. Like don't, don't be us. Yeah. Uh, follow your unique call and the unique identity that Jesus has for you and your context. We're part of this larger network, the underground network. We stand on the shoulders of Tampa underground. We're so grateful for them. Um, so I do encourage you to find some network. Uh, don't be isolated. Don't be uh, all out there on your own. Find a larger community to connect with. Um, if you're curious about the Underground Network, you can go to undergroundnetwork.com. Um, and there's what, 20 sister movements, Brian? How many? Yeah, something like that. 
Yeah. This isn't a recruiting call. <laughs> uh, but I'm so grateful that we're a part of this larger network. Sure. Um, and it's been a real gift to us. Yeah. Well, we, again, we hope you'll join us in two weeks. Uh, if you're near Nashville next week, jump in there. Uh, otherwise, watch the live stream and we say grace and peace. Thank mm-hmm. you.